From what I've heard, people's opinions on the first Ant-Man generally range from it's one of the best MCU films to yeah, it's alright, and I think I'm more leaning towards the lower end of that spectrum. It's fun for the most part, but it's more average than a lot of the MCU films, and it's one that I haven't really revisited, which is unusual for me with MCU films. The sequel though, I was more excited for. It wasn't wrapped up in production problems like the first, and it looked crazier and more fun than the first. So how does Ant-Man and the Wasp stack up to the rest of the MCU in this post-Infinity War phase of films? Let's talk about it. Maybe you just need someone watching your back. Like a partner. And as I mostly do for these sorts of films, I'm going non-spoilers first, and then with a warning, I'll get into spoilers later on. So overall, Ant-Man and the Wasp, I thought it was pretty good. It is flawed, and of Phase 3, it's definitely towards the bottom of these, but that also just speaks to the quality of Phase 3 so far. It's a fun good time in the cinema, mostly. First off, Paul Rudd has got to be one of the most likable actors in Hollywood. He's very charismatic, very funny, and I'm so happy he's part of the MCU. He's obviously great. Michael Douglas, Lawrence Fishburne, Michelle Pfeiffer, Jim Halpert, they're all good. Michael Pena is pretty hilarious once again, he's probably the funniest part of the film. Villain-wise, I loved Walton Goggins in this. Side note. What a name. He chews up the scenery a bit, and was clearly having fun, and I was engaged whenever he was on screen. Hannah John Kamen is pretty good as Ghost, and in my opinion Ghost is a better villain than Yellow Jacket. Like she has a better motivation, and is a more interesting character, but she does still feel more like an average MCU villain. Not the blandness level of Ronan or Malekith, but more around a Kaecilius. And finally, the other lead in the film, Evangeline Lilly as Wasp. I'll be honest, at first, I didn't love her. Not the performance, Evangeline Lilly is great, but the way her character was written, at least at the start, I found her a bit unlikable, and it seemed a bit out of line with what the first film had ended on in terms of her character, even though yes, I know a lot happened between that that affects this film. However, as the film goes on, specifically after a scene at a school, her character got much better for me, and I ended up really liking her. She not only was quite likable by the end, but also really badass. Her action scenes were really cool. I also loved her team up moments with Scott in terms of action and in terms of romance. They actually have pretty good chemistry. I'd love to see more of her character in the future. Another big part of most MCU films, but especially Ant-Man, is the comedy, seeing as this comes from a comedy director and is a famous comic actor as one of the leads. And yeah, it's pretty funny. Not every joke hit for me, but it was more hits than misses for sure. And again, Luis's stories were pretty hilarious. Going into this, I'd somehow forgotten about those, and as soon as I heard that music gearing up, it just made me smile. The movie also has a few emotional moments. I didn't think all of them were that effective, but there was one towards the end that, especially thanks to the performances, kinda hit me. Action-wise, I think this is much better than the first Ant-Man, and it was exactly what I was hoping for. There's so much you can do with this premise of shrinking and growing stuff, and this film fully takes advantage of it. Some really creative stuff here. And that's when I think this movie is at its best, when it's got all this crazy comic book stuff and size manipulation in the action. Effects-wise, also pretty fantastic, almost nothing looked fake to me, except for one shot in particular. The best part of this film for me was easily the finale. Overall, I really enjoyed the third act. If the whole movie had had that level of energy, I think it would be up there with some of the other MCU Phase 3 films. There are chases and fight sequences with that size manipulation involved. Awesome stuff. And ultimately, and this will lead into me talking about what I didn't like so much, the movie really picks up after that school scene that I mentioned. Most stuff after that was funny or exciting or I was engaged in. That's where I felt this film shined. On the other side of that coin though, there's the first part of the film. And now I'm going to talk negatives. I saw in a few reviews people saying, I enjoyed the first part of this film, but it really falls apart in the third act. And I couldn't disagree more. I thought the first part of this film, I'm not sure how long exactly, but maybe like the first 45 minutes or an hour, was easily the weakest part. Firstly, the opening scene I thought was really bad. It felt like they'd made the rest of the film and then were like, oh, what if someone hasn't seen the first Ant-Man? Let's just give him a recap and a way through dialogue that feels really unnatural and forced. It reminded me a little bit of the Black Panther opening scene, as in, in that film, it feels sort of out of place. So the movie didn't start strong for me. The rest of that first half, while there were a few standout moments in terms of action and comedy, like Scott's house arrest montage, a lot of it was really bland to me. It felt like the worst parts of the first Ant-Man again, where in that film, there were quite a few scenes where it's just characters either spouting exposition or spouting science mumbo-jumbo. It's not horrible, it's just not very engaging, and the way it was executed, it just felt a bit bland, and at some points, a bit dull. Again, not without some good moments, but if I rewatch this film, I'll probably fast forward through a lot of that first half. It was just very, eh, to me. There are a few other things as well, a big one I would say would be the stakes. Now, I really like the fact that they didn't try to have like another end of the world type story, because right after Infinity War, you can't really raise the stakes beyond that. You need to have a more personal story. It's kind of like the Winter Soldier. After the Avengers, it's good to have a more grounded, relatively speaking, story with more personal stakes. That I liked. 
The problem is I never really felt that concerned for anyone involved, or like it wasn't going to work out. The stakes just never feel that high, not just for the world, but even for the characters who this film revolves around. A smaller reason for this could be that sometimes humor breaks scenes that are more serious, and it feels kinda out of place and immediately takes any possible tension out of that scene, like especially when it's characters who aren't necessarily jokey who are doing it. But that happens in a lot of MCU films, and it's not usually that big of a problem. In this, in that climax, even though I was having a lot of fun, I never really felt like it wasn't gonna work out for the heroes. I wasn't on the edge of my seat at all. I was enjoying myself, but I was never actually worried that something was gonna go wrong. And I know, in these films, with a few exceptions, you know everything's gonna work out for the heroes more or less. But at its best, this kind of film can make you forget about that, and still keep you really invested. In this, during any big action scene or tense part of the climax, I was like, yeah, they're gonna be fine. In that as well, there weren't really that many surprises in this film for me, and overall it might have had a bit too much going on. Like maybe one of these plot lines could have been trimmed down, or possibly even cut entirely. Because at points, the movie can feel a little bloated, and overall ends up feeling a bit longer than it is. Also, this isn't anything against the movie itself, but I really wish they hadn't put this giant man part in all the trailers and all the TV spots. Because that scene was really cool, but it would have been so much cooler if we hadn't seen it so many times. I get that they sort of had to, you know, marketing, you want a big epic part to the trailer that people remember and talk about, but I'm just saying. In a perfect world, they would have left that out. Overall, Ant-Man and the Wasp is another good MCU movie. Personally, I find it incredible that they've been going for this long, with this many films, and in my opinion, haven't made a bad one yet. At worst, they're just average. This, I would say, is a good step above totally average. It's a very fun time with some creative action, good effects, funny moments, and a pretty likable cast. It does take a bit of time to get going, has a few dull spots, and ultimately is more bland than the other MCU films we've gotten lately. I guess we're spoiled with the MCU movies we get, but most of these that we've gotten lately have all had their own distinct feels and styles. And this one, while not totally generic, just doesn't quite sit among those in my opinion. Still, I'd recommend it, it's good summer fun. I'll give Ant-Man and the Wasp an 8.5 out of 10. As far as my MCU ranking, I'd probably put it here, and yes, I'm pretty sure I didn't forget any this time. Okay, so now we're talking spoilers. There isn't a lot I have to say here, but the few things there are, yeah, some of them are pretty massive. So, spoiler warning, you've been warned, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, okay. Also spoilers for Avengers Infinity War, but come on, you've seen it. Firstly, just a few small things. One, I like the fact that Marvel finally acknowledged that the classic Marvel disguise of sunglasses and a cap is stupid and wouldn't ever work. Not only with the joke, but also in the fact that Hope and Hank are immediately discovered. An Ant-Man staple returns in this film, that being de-aged Michael Douglas, and it does look pretty great. Whoever Marvel gets for their de-aging effects, they need a raise, because Marvel is clearly the best at this. Also, this isn't spoilery at all, and this is a very small thing, and I'm sure I've said this before, but I just want to make sure that I have it on record. I love that MCU opening logo. A lot of people say it's too long or it's self-indulgent, but I don't care. It gets me hyped up for the film every time I see it. I like Janet reuniting with Hope, that's that one emotional moment I was talking about. I also like that this film just has a straight up, kind of over the top happy ending. After Infinity War, it was sort of nice to just be smiling when the credits started. I mean, then the credits kept going, and well, we'll get to that in a sec. Also, I just want to ask, when does this film take place in the MCU timeline? Because I guess I'm pretty invested in that now. It must be right before Infinity War, or like at the same time as Infinity War, right? Because it's two years after Civil War. Between the start of Infinity War and the snap, it's about, what, two days or so? So this has to be before that, otherwise I think people would be more weirded out by the crazy aliens in New York. But in Infinity War, I'm pretty sure they mentioned Scott's under house arrest, and no one in that scene is like, yeah, but remember that time he became giant and ran around San Francisco like a month ago? But hey, don't get me wrong, this isn't a complaint or anything. I'm just trying to place this. And when you think about it, Spider-Man Homecoming apparently takes place in 2020, so whatever. And now, finally, let's talk post-credits. And the very last post credit scene, gotta be honest, it's not worth staying for. I usually wouldn't say that, because I think, even if it's very minor, a hardcore fan might want to see it. But you've seen it in the trailer, you've seen it earlier in the film, it's just not worth staying for. I mean, if you want to see everyone who worked on the film, by all means. But for people who are just there for the scene, which I think is most people, yeah, you can skip it. The mid credit scene, though. Man. I mean, everyone knew something like that was going to happen, and the entire scene I was just waiting, like, okay, one of you is going to turn to dust in a second. But the actual execution of it, I thought was great. Almost like a horror film. I guess Scott's now trapped in the quantum realm until Avengers 4. I will say, this does sort of confirm to me that, yeah, these dead heroes are coming back. And like, that was pretty certain already, not just because sequels have already been announced, but because, no matter how risky their storytelling might get, Marvel is not going to kill off Spider-Man, Black Panther, nearly all of the Guardians of the Galaxy, etc. 
permanently. And here, it just sunk in that they wouldn't have used this film to set up the Wasp as this awesome hero and spend all this time bringing Janet out of the Quantum Realm just to kill them immediately. They're all gonna come back. Also, I'm pretty sure Janet said something about time travel, or something like that, in the Quantum Realm, which sort of made me sit up in my seat and think, hey, that's probably important, but more on that in a future video. Finally though, I just want to say this mid credit scene really emphasizes just how big this universe is, and how these smaller films are sort of now just like episodes in a bigger story. And honestly, that's not a bad thing. But at this point, these films aren't really standalone films. If you showed this movie to someone who had no idea what Marvel is, it would be the most bizarre thing in the world to them. The movie has a proper structure, beginning, middle, happy end, and then most of the main characters die during the credits. It's not like other MCU films where the end credit scene is mostly just like a tease to what's coming in the future, this is like a big plot point. But again, to clarify, I do not dislike that. This is a very new and innovative type of franchise that's never been done before on this scale. So this idea of these films being so intertwined, especially leading up to a big event like Avengers 3 or 4, I really like. That being said, I'm also a huge fan of these films, who's followed the story and knows everything that's going on, and I might be a little worried if I was Marvel that this tactic may start to alienate certain people who like aren't caught up completely, but with Infinity War being as big of a cultural phenomenon as it was, I think this example works, and like 99% of the people who see it are gonna get it. All that said, the scene itself was pretty awesome, left me even more excited for Avengers 4, and also very much shocked a lot of the people in my cinema, which did amuse me. One of the people next to me just yelled, oh shit, at the screen. So those were my thoughts on Ant-Man and the Wasp. What did you think of it? Let me know all of your thoughts down below in the comments. While you're at it, be sure to like this video, check out my Instagram and Twitter at BHL underscore Hudson, check out this podcast about movies and TV and whatnot I do every other week with a friend of mine, it's called The Poorly Planned Podcast, and subscribe for more videos like the one you just watched. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.